for the city to subsidize or offset the cost of whatever you might make in terms of improvements to streets and the sidewalks and ideally recoup that cost or even have somebody else pay for it. Chapter 13 I talked about soils, plants, and climate. And then at the, the last slide in this lecture is more or less a checklist of things that you'll need to submit on August 9th, two weeks from tonight. And then once I'm done talking, you guys get to meet in your groups. So street mix, let me pull this up real quickly. Because again, a lot of you might not be familiar with streets. A lot of times you're focused on the real estate aspect, or whatever that built object is. And so, you, know what, you guys aren't the only ones. I guess traffic is really bad. Yeah. Or you, you just didn't want to come. I don't know. <laughs> but, not the matter. Hey, how you doing? But okay, so it's having trouble loading street mix. Normally this works. Here's what it looks like. So street mix, and you can actually save these online. So let's say you're going to a meeting. And again, I don't know how to do a lot of these things myself based on the programs that I know. But you have all this stuff set up. I'm going to show you, but you can change things like the bike lane. You can narrow these lanes up to a certain point, and you can also widen them. So a lot of times cities will talk about how there's too many lanes that's turned into a boulevard. We can get rid of one of these lanes, and you can say, let's put a wider sidewalk there, or something along those lines. So uh, you can even name the street if you so choose. I'm not going to do that. But right now it's set for an 80-foot width, and you can even change the the width from 40 to 60 to 80. So depending on what the width is of the street that you're actually working with. And again, if you're having a public meeting, you can show how you were going to change different things. And so that's one of the nice things about the street mix uh, thing that it, it's also free. I can't remember if I said that. It's a okay. free thing that all of you can access. So if you were to type in www.streetmix.net, this will pop up. So again, you can do things like, let's say you want to make the sidewalk wider. Well, you can do that, but if you take a look, see how it starts to turn red? That means you've exceeded the, uh, the right away that's required. And so anytime something flashes in red, you'll get this message, this segment doesn't fit within the street. So we'll just remove that. Let's just do it in the street. Okay. So you can do things like, let's say you have a drive lane try to make it wider. What happens is if you don't take a, or if you don't narrow the lanes or narrow the sidewalk or any of those things, what'll happen is if you wind it without shrinking into that, you see the buildings turn red, which means you're more or less encroaching on the right of way for the existing buildings. And so again, if you know the dimensions of the area that you're looking at, you can actually have this match up to an actual real world scenario or setting if you know the widths of the lanes and other things on that street. So you can set it up exactly like that and tour with it a little bit in terms of not just the building, but what kind of sidewalk or streetscape improvements might you have. Any questions? Okay. Let's play around with it. You can do all kinds of fun things. We may not necessarily fun, but for those of you who don't have time to learn a computer graphics program to do this from scratch, this gives you the ability to be slightly dangerous based on a free program that's available on the internet. Is that what? what? Yes, 
Oh yeah, so you can save as image, image share using Facebook, share using a Twitter phone. about some basics related to streets. And these basic dimensions aren't based on what's in Lynch's book because his book is dated. So all these things come from more recent sources that are available such as the, uh, on the first slide, most of this comes from the design of streets, or sorry, the Urban Street Design Guide, which is created or published by the National Association of City Transportation Officials. So it's essentially guidance on how cities should have their streets based on certain sizes. So in other words, residential scales versus commercial scales and a variety of other things. And they have all these guidelines online also. So in terms of lane width, traditionally, they say that it should be 11 to 13 feet for an average lane. The recommendation is that it should be less than 12 feet wide. And uh, if you have more space, then like let's say a 13 foot lane, what happens? How do you want well, to see, how many of you consider yourself to, yourselves to be good drivers? <laughs> yeah, because this is Florida. So let's say you have really wide lanes, what is the tendency to do? A combination of that, but if you have more space, there's a tendency to speed, the wider the lane is. You get a little bit confident sometimes. And the narrower the lanes are, technically they've done some studies that say that people will drive slower. So smaller lanes, technically speaking, people will drive slower. It's not always the case. But that's why they recommend smaller lanes. Because they've done these studies that say that there's a correlation between lane width and vehicle speed. So narrower lanes usually to lower speeds, whether there's a speed limit or not. The benefits of having smaller lanes, and they've done a bunch of studies on this, are things like safety, so people ideally would drive slower. It reduces the crossing distance, so in other words, if you're crossing a street, like, think about some of the streets that we have in South Florida. Has anybody ever tried to walk across something like Military Trail, or Jaw, or any major road? At the time, you don't get that much time to cross that road. So if you have smaller roads, it's easier for pedestrians to cross that. And if you look at some of the better uh, areas throughout Florida in terms of walking, you can get across roads a lot easier because for the most part, they're usually narrow. The other option is having traffic lights where they're red for five minutes because the intersections are so long. You also have shorter signal cycles because when it's green, if everybody's in one lane versus six lanes, you can get more people technically through that light. You also get less storm water because if you have a lot more pavement, that water has nowhere to go. So if you have smaller lanes, you can either account for it in terms of better sewage or water drainage, or you have more water that's just landing on grass and getting absorbed by soil. And then finally, there's less construction material to build these smaller roads. So here's a quick question for you. Let's say you have freighter buses. Which lane do you think is the best line to use? The right lane. Right. So whatever's the curbside lane. And ideally, if you're going to have wider outside lanes to accommodate freight and buses, then you would want your inside lanes to be of whatever the minimum is for passenger vehicles. 
one of the problems in Florida is that if those lanes are narrower, you can still see trucks and buses in there. So there's still no perfect way to do this because some lanes, even on the inside, are probably wider than they need to be. But it's to accommodate a lot of the freight and the buses that we have here. Then you have things like vertical speed control elements. And these things make a lot of sense for streets that have speed limits that are 30 miles per hour or less. So when you hear that, we're largely talking about residential areas. So you're not going to be throwing these up on, um, on Davey Road. I mean, you could, but you're going to get a lot of angry people due to damage to the undercarriage of the cars. So the three things are speed humps, not bumps, uh, speed tables, and speed cushions. And I'm going to talk about all those. So here's what a speed hump looks like. Can you tell where it is? Actually, it doesn't show up too well, but it's right there. And so that's a speed hump, and the specifications for a speed hump are essentially they're about three to four inches high. So we're not talking about something really high, just a couple of inches. And normally they're 12 to 14 feet wide. And again, if you're talking about a residential street, that's pretty close to being a majority of the center area of the street. And then you're talking about three to six feet of a ramp. So it's almost more of a, not necessarily a bump, but a little bit more gradual than that. And ideally, this will cause people to slow down to 15 to 20 miles per hour, wherever these might exist. The next thing is speed table. Has anybody seen these used for certain things? Think about where it's located. Right, so it's largely used for pedestrians. It's essentially a raised crosswalk to some extent. But the other thing is that it, it separates, it's essentially a great separation from being just a crosswalk to being this speed table. So ideally cars will slow down because they actually see the change in the pavement. Whereas if you just have a flat crosswalk painted on, that doesn't necessarily make people slow down at all unless there's a stop sign or some kind of signal there. Then you have the, uh, some of the benefits are that you have a flat top so there's no bump at all. And it's usually about three to three and a half inches high for the most part. It's 22 feet long, which is larger than the other thing. So in other words, it actually serves as a raised crosswalk. And this is better in areas where you have speed limits of 25 to 45 miles per hour. So if you look at this compared to, um, I had this additional stuff. All right, look at this one. Everybody looking? Okay. And look at the difference between that and this one. So a speed cushion is similar to a speed hump, but how does it differ? It's hard to see it. Sometimes you still hit it going fast. Right, so you still hit it going fast. One of the main reasons for putting in speed cushions, especially in areas that have larger populations, is for emergency vehicles. Because what happens is their wheels can get around that without it serving as a bump. So you sometimes see these, and again, the main reason is for things like fire trucks, the main thoroughfares sometimes will have these so that the fire trucks can get over it without yeah. And the idea is that the width, the width is enough for passenger cars that's going to impact them. But for a fire truck that's wider, they can get over that without any problems. Because how many of you, have, well, we're going to talk about it. I was in an ambulance once. And it was awful because it was hitting a lot of bumps. And it was in an area around a school, so there were a bunch of speed bumps. And going over that stuff in speed bumps, it's not a lot of fun. So something like a speed cushion works a lot better. So uh, from that perspective, they do have some benefits, especially where you're talking about you have a lot of emergency services. So in other words, let's say an area where you have an assisted living facility or a hospital, something along those lines, this would be a good uh, traffic calming mechanism. So any questions on these things before we move on? Sidewalks. Okay. So sidewalks, the minimum sidewalk width should be five feet. Anybody know why they suggest five feet? The 
That's sort of it. Yeah, that's, that's right. They, they feel that five feet is the estimated width of two people walking side by side, or one person walking in opposite directions. But it enables them to pass without bumping into people. And so that, ideally, is the minimum uh, distance. But they have things like sidewalk zones. So for larger sidewalks, they have things such as a frontage zone, pedestrian through zone, a street furniture curb zone, or an enhancement buffer zone. So in other words, all these things are all more or less parts of the sidewalk. So there's where the pedestrians walk, there's that frontage area that's usually adjacent to the street. Then you'll have the street furniture curb zone, which sometimes is next to that. Or in other cases, you could have a buffer zone where you've got the sidewalk, then you've got the buffer zone, then you have the street. So the idea is, how can you make people on that sidewalk feel safe? And sometimes there'll be a buffer. Sometimes that street furniture will act as that buffer. Because people are going to be less likely to drive up on a sidewalk if there's a bench there. Although based on some of the things I've seen in the metropolitan area, sometimes it doesn't matter. People just end up on the sidewalk. It's like, when I was in Cleveland, it was right before the RNC thing. That's not why I was there. You guys know I got family up there. <laughs> but the cops were heavily trafficking the area where you pick up passengers. And the guy was saying, it's called, it's called curbside pickup, not streetside pickup. And he was telling people to get out of the street and get on the curb. Because they were trying to figure out how to make the best movement for all the people that were going into the RNC. Yeah, yeah. Right, so there's some important things to know about sidewalks in general, beyond the whole being at least five feet wide. Can you find that critical stuff why I grab some water? Um, you need control joints to keep the concrete together. <laughs> Is, is this something in a different class? Is that the construction <laughs> class? Yeah. There's actually some other. Uh, actually, I don't, I'm going to talk about this when I was talking about the trees. That a lot of people like to have street trees because it makes a tree look nice when you've got tree lined streets. But the problem is that you need to be really aware or knowledgeable about the root system of whatever you plant. Because as that tree matures, a lot of times what happens is that root system, it spreads out and it ends up pushing up the sidewalk. So you have blocks of this, uh, the concrete start cracking because it's kind of like uh, plates in the earth's shelf and earthquakes is not as drastic as that. But it's the same type of concept where you have the roots pushing up and the, the sidewalk might be flat like that for now, but if they push a little bit, they end up cracking a lot sooner. And what happens is if you try to cut the roots out or moderate, modify the root somehow, you might end up killing the tree. That makes people mad. But uh, the other option is you let the tree stay and you just keep repairing the sidewalk constantly. Or you might be able to curb the sidewalk around the tree root system to allow it to grow, but that costs money too. And then of course you have to encroach on somebody's front yard, so then there's the right of way issues and all those other fun things. But in terms of other sidewalk information unrelated to the uh, construction class, one of the issues in terms of the Americans with Disabilities Act is that sidewalks should exist in all urban areas. So in South Florida, do we have sidewalks in all the urban areas? No. To some extent, we don't. And to some extent, the sidewalks we have, if you were in a wheelchair, they still would not be passable because of the, uh, the poor maintenance on them. So the minimum through zone should be six feet. So I said the minimum should be five feet, but ideally what they say is that it actually should be six feet. It should be a little bit larger. Because people are, have, have gotten larger, but so there's a little bit more of a comfort zone and a little bit more space. And the idea is to make things a little bit more pedestrian friendly so that there's less likelihood of them getting hit. And they feel safer walking and there's a little bit more space so that when you walk by somebody, you have at least a little bit more space to pass them. Some other things, I already touched on this, but the absolute minimum of five feet. 
And again, some urban areas it would be better to have an eight foot or 10 foot or 12 foot wide sidewalk. Because then maybe people will congregate, hang out, but not loiter. So uh, it works out a little bit better. In some cases, you can have sidewalk cafes if you have more sidewalk. If it's adjacent to moving traffic, the minimum should be eight feet with a minimum buffer of two feet for street furniture and utilities. So there you're talking about 10 feet if it's by any road that gets a decent amount of traffic. And then, of course, you need sufficient lighting, shade, benches, bus shelters, and all those other types. Then you have fun things like curb extensions. And again, curb extensions from a development standpoint, they're a way to sort of calm the traffic. If there are traffic issues surrounding your development, and let's say that you've got this great building and you're trying to get it all leased up, but there are issues with the surrounding infrastructure in terms of sidewalks or the streets. Curb extensions are one way where you might be able to help, not necessarily add value to the building, but just change the appearance very slightly. So the sidewalk might be really small and it might seem like people are moving really fast, but curb extensions are one way where you can slow things down and actually beautify the area to some extent too. And the four ways you can do this are through pinch points and chokers, Gateways and neck downs, I think, it's, I think it's pronounced chicanes. I've never actually had to talk about it in a lecture, is that correct? Okay, so in bus bulbs is the fourth thing. So pinch points and chokers, this is what they look like. So what they do is they more or less take away a lane and that narrows the street and again it gives that perception of, okay, things are getting narrower. How many of you speed up when things get narrower? Right, because unless it's like fast and furious or you're doing something along those lines like street racing, most people, if it gets really narrow, there's a tendency to slow down. And so the idea with a pinch point or a choker is that when you start getting to this point, you realize that you should slow down because there's really only one lane that gets through. So hopefully you won't like speed up and try to like cut off the other people, but that happens in Florida too. Gateways and neck downs, so the difference between pinch points, those are usually mid-block. So depending on what it is that you're doing from a real estate standpoint, if you're in the middle of a block, this is one way to deal with some of those traffic issues that you might have. If you're at the front end or the corner of two major streets, one of the things you want to look at are gateways and neck downs, where instead of having these two additional lanes, you sort of close them in, you can beautify it with some landscaping, and of course have the sidewalk there, and sorry, the crosswalk, and you give the pedestrians more space. So when people turn in, you have sort of a nice little like vista or view as they turn onto that street. So it's kind of an easy way to beautify it with a combination of concrete and some landscaping on the corner, and that's it. So you're not talking about changing really anything about the street, you're just narrowing it right at the mouth of the street. And the idea of chicanes is that it's a combination of the other two things where you actually change it up a little bit. And they've done studies that people tend to actually slow down a little bit more because when you're driving, you can't really see this little twist. It just looks like it ends there. So you have to slow down because perceptually, you're thinking that, okay, you know the street goes, but why is this here? So it sort of causes you, it's supposed to cause you, to slow down as you're driving through it. So putting these throughout, it kind of will require people to slow down, technically speaking. And then bus bulbs, they're just a way to protect people who are at a bus shelter, or people that are waiting. So putting this further out, what it does is it takes away a lane of traffic and protects the people a little bit better who might be waiting at that shelter. So intersection, uh, where people and cars meet. How many of you are familiar with Google's patent application that they just submitted for their self-driving car? Any of you have heard of this? It's a, what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to be an adhesive glue on the front end of the car. So that if a, it does hit a pedestrian, this glue sort of like I guess it pops out or it's supposed to make it so that rather than getting a hit in terms of an impact, 
it cushions the hit and you just stick to the front of the self-driving car. I mean, I've never been hit by a car as a pedestrian, but I don't think it would feel good if it was like, it's like a, a people-sized version of flypaper, is what it boils down to. And so that's a patent that they recently submitted, I think two weeks ago. But I saw something about it on the news. I mean, so the person's gonna stop, is that why? Yes. Well, they assume that the person won't like bounce off. They'll just sort of be absorbed. No, the person driving will stop. Well, I mean, it's self-driving. Self so ideally, oh, that if oh, that's true. yeah, so so hopefully it knows to stop. But if not, that person's going to be going for a ride. So only up to a certain speed. But, right. Uh, if not, then they just go flying. Right. Yeah. The, the idea is that the car won't go that won't be going that slow when it hits the pedestrian. So I mean, it's really interesting. Because I don't know how I feel about a whole bunch of self-driving cars. I don't know what would be better down here. I don't know. Bumper cars, probably. But How many of you ever read the magazine highlights? Like, waiting in a doctor's office as a kid. You can still read it as an adult. There's no age maximum on it. But remember how they had those pictures? You have this picture, and you have to think of what's different with the other picture, right? We're about to do some highlights here, because you're never too old for that stuff. So, here's the before picture. Everybody see it? See it? Some street trees, some street furniture. I think that's everything. So, and so the, the option is there's that. And again, let's say that from a real estate development perspective, you're developing on one of these corners, or you own one of these assets and you're trying to get it leased up. But you're having issues with some of the surrounding areas in terms of the sidewalk, the streetscape, or whatever the case might be. 
these are things where you can work with the city to say if you'd like to see this done. And sometimes the city will either pay or subsidize heavily to make these improvements. And so these minor improvements can add value to your building because maybe you don't have a bunch of people getting killed in the intersection anymore. Or it's easier for people to get there because it makes it more walkable. Any questions on that? Okay. So moving along, how many of you really like utility systems? Mm -hmm. well, utility systems become really important if you're downtown or if you're on the urban periphery, and it might be expensive to hook into infrastructure. So if you're on the periphery, you have to pay more. What's wrong with being downtown? Most downtowns have the oldest infrastructure in existence for every single city. So in other words, downtown Miami, I'm sure parts of the infrastructure are probably 100 years old. Maybe they're really old. In downtown Cleveland, they routinely have flooding because the water main will break because it's 100 years old. And so rather than replacing the entire infrastructure, which is really expensive, they do a piecemeal. So when a water main breaks, that's when they fix it. But that 100-year-old water main now it's a year old, but all the pipes that it connects to the other water mains are still 100 years old. So it's really difficult because the only other option is to dig up major parts of the street. And in some cases, especially in areas where they're growing, the sewer system has to expand. And the only way to do that is to add wider pipes. So in other words, I was telling everybody that I drove down from the city of Live Oak today. Right now the city of Live Oak has twice as much infrastructure for the current capacity that they have. So it's right now they've got about 7,000 people that live in the city, but they could support 15,000 based on their infrastructure. So that's, that puts them in a good position for growth, even though that growth will be very gradual over time. Places like Miami, and well, pretty much all throughout South Florida, the infrastructure that we have is just barely keeping pace with the number of people we have. And so every time you need to put in new infrastructure, you're talking about having to dig up streets, because that's the right of way, and that's where the infrastructure currently is. And that means that you have streets that are blocked off or uh, lanes that are closed down for an extended period of time. Because these aren't overnight projects. Usually they're 18 month to several year type projects depending on how long the sewer line is or the water line or any of those things. Now so you're talking about regional systems. So in other words, a lot of real estate development is site specific. You just connect to the infrastructure and you're done. So it's like plug and chug. You just run with it. But if these systems start failing, it becomes a regional problem and definitely a city level problem. So then you have to start having to realize that you need to come up with a consistent source of funding, which is usually user fees in terms of people that use it have to pay for it. But you have to maintain these systems over 30 years. So you're not just doing it in the span of a year and you're done, but you have to continually upgrade and update that. So it becomes a big problem, especially in South Florida, because we're surrounded by water, right? But yet we don't have enough fresh water here. So in other words, how much of the world's water supply is fresh water? Less than 2%? Correct. It's 1%. The, the glaciers and everything else, that's 2%. And the other 97% is all salt water. So think about that number. That's what I learned when I said, have any of you been to the Walk of the Hatchie wetlands? or Green K up in Palm Beach County? Okay. <laughs> You're missing out. I'll just say that. But anyway, there are water reclamation projects, so my water fees, or my water sewer fees, a portion of that goes to maintain these wetlands that were reclaimed by the water district. And then what they did was they built boardwalks all throughout. So there's a mile long trail, mile and a half long trail, and then they have, of course, all the native wildlife from alligators to wood storks, and cranes, snakes, yeah. all that kinds of fun stuff. So anyway, the big picture is that you've got these city level utility systems, you've got regional state systems, but all these are actually overseen by, I'm going to call it NISAC, but what it stands for is the National Infrastructure Simulation and Analysis Center. This is something that was developed in the aftermath of 9-11. Because what they realize is that, you know what, our water system, our sewer systems, 
all of our infrastructure, they're some of the most vulnerable things in the United States. And what they realize is that there's no oversight for all of these infrastructure systems. So at the national level, you've got this National Infrastructure Simulation Analysis Center that just figures out what would we do if we had a major failure in any of these infrastructure systems. So they oversee everything from chemicals to dams, emergency services, transportation systems, water and wastewater, to uh, healthcare, uh, nuclear reactors. How many of you are familiar with Turkey? It's Turkey Point. It's a nuclear power plant that's in uh, Homestead, somewhere in that area. And based on some of the sea level rise projections, they think in 10 years, maybe 20 years, that all the pathways to that nuclear power plant are going to be underwater because it's so low lying. And one of the issues with that is you really don't want salt water gnawing away at the side of a nuclear reactor because that just doesn't have power. Well, Where is it located? What? Where is it located? Yeah, I think it's in Homestead. Isn't it? There's one up the coast and uh, is it Martin? There's two. Two? Yeah, it's the one across from, uh, it's on the other side of 595, by Port Everglades. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, there's one there. Yeah. It's always blown out of smoke. It's always reassuring, right? <laughs> Yeah, on the, on the uh, north side of 595, we're going to cross from the airport. So real quick aside, in, outside of Toledo, there's this plant called, I think it's Davis Bessie. And a couple years back, they almost had a huge meltdown because a tornado went over the cooling tower and it was sucking all the water out of the cooling oh, wow. tower. And they really didn't have any plan for that. Sure. But fortunately, they didn't have to shut it down. But more importantly, in terms of utility, I went from talking about it at a, a national level, very large level, to more specific at the site level, talking about things like storm drainage. So when it rains, where does the water go? Does it drain normally or not? And you have things like sanitary drainage. When you flush the toilet, does it go where it's supposed to go? Where's it going in Florida? About two miles out into the ocean. How many of you like to eat grouper? No, I don't say that. It really goes in the ocean. Does it really? Yeah. Yeah. I knew that. <laughs> okay, what about grouper? <laughs> what about bath grouper? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get to it. <laughs> no wonder Pacific. It was, it was one of those things where I took it off the that's took it out of the lecture and then I put it back in. I was like, I should put this back in. Yeah. That's what they so you. But yeah, that's. No, they're not toxic. Anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. But, but now you got to say, it's, it's a tea. It's called a teaser. It's hard to do that with the material that I have to teach sometimes. But, but anyway, we're talking about water and the importance of water planning. One thing to think about is that if you're trying to do something that's a higher intensity form of development in Florida, you actually have to get water contracts. So in other words, you can't just say, hey, as a city, I'm just going to do all this development within my boundaries because the regional water districts, the water districts are all regional. And cities have contracts with how much water they can get. If you need to have more water, you need to renegotiate that contract at the regional level. If you have 30 cities that all need more water, you only have X amount of water, how do you figure out how that gets done? Because if you're trying, if you're the developer, you can't really say, uh, when you put those plants in through the city, those city planners, they have to go and figure these things out. And if there's not enough water for everybody in the city, all the new developments, then that can actually be a curb on development. Back when I was in Texas, when they had the massive, uh, I mean, the drought lasted for multiple years. And one of the biggest issues that developers had was they couldn't get water to mix concrete. And that's a big issue. So water does play a role in development at the site level and the city level and a variety of other levels. So water planning, 
basically the state has a state water management plan. If you look at the different levels, you're talking about state, regional, and local. The state has a, a comprehensive plan, and that's in Chapter 187 of the Florida Statute. And each local government, they have to have a local comprehensive plan that feeds into the regional comprehensive plans. And the state government, the Department of Community Affairs, which I think is a different name now, they oversee all these local comprehensive plans. And so how this planning ties into water policy is that you've got state water policy and water quality standards and the water management district that they have on regional levels. So we have the South Florida Water Management District. They have a needs and sources plan and watershed plans in terms of the amount of water available, how that water gets run, and a variety of other things. And then at the local level, you've got local government water planning, and they have to look at things like the water supply plans and basin plans for stormwater retention and detention. Some of you remember the hydrologic cycle. Growing up, you probably learned it in science in elementary school, maybe middle school, maybe it was revisited in high school, depending on what you took maybe college, but this is how we get water. So it starts here, evaporates, transpires, evaporates from the ocean or transpiration from plants, and creates those clouds that we always see, nice pillowy clouds, right? Got to look at this for about six hours today. No rain, I guess that was nice. And then it rains, the rain falls, and goes back. So it's this cycle, and to some extent, some of that water goes through the soil and it replenishes aquifers that are underground. In some cases, if you have a surface aquifer, it will replenish that surface aquifer. So one of the important things about storm drainage is that how you build things, not just the building, but the surrounding area, the ground, what materials you use can have an impact on whether you have constant flooding on your site or not. So in other words, there are a lot of parking lots that if they have poor drainage and it's all concrete, then the water just sits there. So when it's not raining, it's great for parking, but when it is raining, especially when you get a lot of rain like we do tend to get in South Florida, it becomes a pool. And that's not good. So the idea is that if you have different types of ground cover throughout your site, you can absorb some of that water to minimize runoff and flooding issues that you might have. So if you take a look, this is if you just have natural ground cover. Let's say you don't develop anything. Think of this as like a park or any type of green space. So 40% of that evaporates or transpires into the air. And you only have 10% of runoff. And the rest of it is absorbed into the ground, either deep into the ground or shallow the top couple feet of the ground. And as you go from this natural state to impervious surfaces, like concrete, you get into this situation where only 5% goes into the deep part of the ground, 10% is at the shallow part, 55% of that is all runoff. And the problem with that is that this 55% runoff means that you have standing water somewhere. And again, of course, now it's not just flooding, but with all the mosquito issues we have, whether you would like to get malaria or West Nile virus or Zika or chikungunya or any of those other wonderful things that I've learned since I moved to Florida. I um, mean, in Texas and in Ohio, I was just worried about West Nile. But then I came here and it was kind of like, I to learn these other new fun things. But, uh, so if you have a lot of concrete, you run into this situation. So ideally, you'd want to be closer to this situation or this situation, where you minimize the amount of runoff just based on how you pave something. But also maybe have some planters, some trees, and some of those other things, because that helps with the drainage uh, in terms of stormwater runoff. Here's some other ways. Instead of using cement curbs or gutters, use things like grass waterways. Or have conservation buffers, so you have some areas where you might have a lot of water that usually stands. If you don't develop anything, then you just leave them as grass that will naturally act as a filter to absorb some of that. One of the biggest things in Florida is the issue of manure uh, storage and livestock containment, or just runoff from a lot of the farms because that's what's caused a lot of the blue-green algae flare-ups that they've had coming out of Lake Okeechobee and have occurred in Martin County and on the West Coast also. So if you have better containment, less of that stuff gets into the water, causing, and uh, hopefully you'll have fewer problems caused elsewhere. Porous pavement, 
that's the idea of having surfaces that allow more water to filter through it to the ground underneath so you have less runoff on the surface. How many of you know what swales are? Right. So I mean, it's, it's similar to that, but you'll see these alongside a lot of the roads in Florida. So where you don't have canals, you'll see these, and sometimes you'll actually see the concrete. Sometimes you just see grass with a little bit of cement. And the idea is that uh, they have a lot of these in Florida to help deal with water retention or uh, minimizing standing water. So, just our hands again. How many of you like to eat grouper? <laughs> Anyone else? Don't be afraid. Because I, I used to eat grouper until I saw this. <laughs> wastewater collection transmission system permitting. If you're doing any type of new construction, and this is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, you have to provide a construction permit if you are doing an individual service connection from a single family residence, replacing any facilities at any location, construction of um, a variety of other things related to if you were to build a master plan community, things that you would need to have. That doesn't just have to get locally permitted, it has to get permitted at the regional level as well as the state level. So if you're doing something big that's going to require you to use a lot of additional wastewater or need water, you need to file those things through multiple government networks that uh, exist at various levels, which means it adds on to the amount of time that you might otherwise want to uh, develop something. So if you take a look at the line, don't border the grouper. <laughs> but this is about three minutes and 45 seconds. Reassuring voice during tough times. They guide us through the events of our lives and explain the unexplainable. They are the, the problem. Sorry, this is the sponsor of this. And the more we go through together, the more we do. sending this stuff out in the ocean, we'll inject it 3,000 feet underground. So I, that's important because, I mean, rather than sending it out to the ocean, why not just put it where we get our drinking water? I was going to say, right, this is a water tank. <laughs> but it's sense. supposed to be in a tank that is completely, I don't know what you want to call it. 
Sorry, but what they found a ton of there They're a reassuring voice during tough times. They guide us through the events of our lives and explain the unexplained. They are the pros. We feel like we know them. And the more we go through together, the more we do. said in South Florida in our region that the biggest consumer would be split between um, I just kind of don't come out while I do that. Most of you wouldn't be able to necessarily say that well it's a tie between the public water supply and agricultural self supply. So the South Florida Water Management District in terms of how they're set up and their role in this whole process is they more or less oversee all water use in the region. And they have everything from where they get their water, their drinking water from, to water conservation, to a lot of other things related to public education. In terms of what it does, it does this annual estimated water use report, because again, Despite being surrounded by water, it's all salt water. So based on the fresh water that we have, that actually has to be managed because we have growth in terms of population and use of water, but we don't necessarily have growth in terms of the amount of water that we have. In terms of electric power, which sector do you think uses the most electricity? Do you think it's the commercial sector? The industrial sector, residential, or transportation? Industrial. So commercial, industrial, any other answers? Any other answers? Transportation. Yeah, yeah that, that's the one, transportation. Anybody know why? Think about all the cruise ships we have, airports, trains, cars, all that stuff. Um, the transportation is the highest. The average annual electricity cost per household in Florida are $1,900. Do you think it's good or bad? How do you think Florida rates against the other states? Uh, yeah. Oh, annual. Annually. So that comes out to a little bit more than, what, one fifty a month? Somewhere there. I'm not doing that at this point. But anyway. How many of you think it's higher than the U.S. average? Okay, so two of you. How many of you think it's lower? One of you. How many of you think that $1,900 a year for energy costs in Florida is higher than the U.S. average? Okay. All right. I was just curious. I'm going to move on. Uh, how much you get? So on average... That 1900 is actually 40% more than the U.S. average. Anybody know why? Because 
because it gets hot here and we're running our air conditioners all the time. So that's part of it. Actually, that's most of the reason why. The other thing that they that they do, I don't want to say that I mean the uh, energy. Basically, the EIA is a federal government level agency that oversees all the energy in the United States. So they do this household energy use in Florida survey. They do these every couple of years. When I say every couple of years, if you take a look, this is from 2009. But they have uh, data in terms of the fact that because Florida residents use space heating equipment much less than those in other states, site energy consumption is low for Florida homes. But uh, they're typically newer and smaller than homes in other states. So if you take a look in terms of where Florida energy, where that consumption is, 50% are on appliances, electronics, and lighting. 9% is on space heating. 14% is on water heating. And 27% is air conditioning. So if you compare that just to the South Atlantic region, which is uh, Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, Delaware, and the Washington and the District of Columbia, on average, they only spend 13% on air conditioning. And compared to the entire United States, it's 6%. So again, one of the major components uh, that sets Florida apart from other states in the United States is the fact that we do spend a ton of money on air conditioning. So in terms of the main heating fuel used, natural gas is used a lot elsewhere in the United States. In Florida, it's all electricity. The majority of it is electricity. Cooling equipment, we have central AC in Florida, which is more than the South Atlantic region, as well as the US. Then they go into the housing types, year of construction. And again, Florida doesn't have a whole lot that was built before 1950. Noted they have a lot that was built before, really, 1989, or sorry, 1969. Average square footage, U.S., 1971, Florida, about 1,700. Then they have all this other data. Number of TVs, so it's pretty much on par with the U.S. They have a DVR. Number of refrigerators, how many of you have more than one refrigerator? How many of you have a separate freezer? Okay. How many of you have double, triple pane windows? Okay. Programmable thermostat? How many of you have a top loading clothes washer? How, about, how many of you have a car that's parked within 20 feet of an electrical outlet? Because the, the idea here is they're trying to gauge if you have an electric car, can you plug it in and charge it? So, I mean, most garages, I mean, if you have a garage, usually there's at least one outlet in there. So, for the most part, I think that would be higher, but then a lot of people might not have garages. So, if you're talking about carports, so if they have to park in a garage because they live in a multi family development, there might not be a whole lot of outlets in that parking garage. So the EIA does these household surveys every couple of years. Oh, and then to answer that question, which I already answered, I was trying to figure out where I put the table. It was on the next slide. So 35.9% is spent on transportation. And 11.4% is spent on industrial and then commercial is actually the second smallest in a majority of its residential. Or sorry, yeah. the second largest is residential. So the next little round of stuff um, is basically, this is a limestone distribution map of Florida. Anybody know why I put it in here? Yeah. 
limestone tied to? Water. Water, where are water and limestone tied to when you have those two together? Substance. Substance, but more importantly, that's right, sinkholes. So this is essentially a sinkhole sort of incidence map. So in other words, most of the sinkholes are in this area of Florida up to the North Park. So again, when I was up in my book, I found out that Tropical Storm Debbie dumped 30 inches of rain on that. And so you had the flooding issue, but then as it was filtering through the ground and through all the limestone, it created a whole bunch of sinkhole issues also. What was the, of all the uh, limestone deposits they had underneath. So the last two slides touch on soils, plants, and climate. And again, I talked about any state that has a land grant university will have some sort of extension program. By extension program, I mean something along the lines of what they have at the University of Florida. And this EDIS, it stands for the Electronic Data Information Source. So let's say based on where you live, you want to plant some plants. We can go in and click on each one of these things based on the, uh, the climate in Florida. So in other words, is anybody looking to plant anything in their yard at all? I know it's kind of late to be planting new stuff. As an example, to click on one of these. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to click on any palms. So, does everybody know this? That we only have one native palm tree that's native to the state of Florida. It's the sable palm. And I'm just looking for a picture of it. All right, here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this the easy way. So you so this is the only palm tree that's native to Florida. So think about all the palm trees that you probably have on Novus campus. All the beautification that they've been doing and a lot of interchanges, have you seen them bring in all those new palm trees? Most of those are grown in Arizona. So there were some issues in the past that you have all this state taxpayer money that's being sent to Arizona to buy palm trees to make this place look more like Florida. So there's that issue, but the sable palm is actually the only palm tree native to Florida. So some other things you can find are, again, let's say you want to plant annuals. Everybody know why you want to plant annuals? Right, because they'll come back, hopefully, as long as you take care of them. So things like butterfly weed, they attract butterflies. So I mean, they even have a tab here called butterfly plants, and you have all these different things. Why they don't have pictures, it's disappointing. But there are other sources, such as Florida Friendly Landscaping. And this one I like because you've got your different regions, so we're South Florida, right? Then you can click your plant type. Anybody care? Let's do vines, because there's something I'm trying to kill in my yard right now. And it's one hardy bastard. Because it keeps coming back, and he's difficult to kill. And I'm not saying it's, I don't really know the plant's gender, but it's, the, it's a vine that seems to be growing from underground between my fence and my neighbor's fence. So it's hard to get to it because you have to sort of reach through the fence, but then it's also just, I don't like them. But anyway, um, so step two, we got a plant category of vines. Do you want a native plant? Yes. Anybody know why you should normally choose yes? Yes, that's what why you would choose a native plant. Right. I mean, these are plants that you could just steal from somebody else's yard. Plant in yours, it should be fine. Because it's native to the area. And I'm not saying go steal other people's plants, but what I'm saying is that native plants, you know they're going to work better. They're used to the salinity because we're so close to salt water. So there's a higher salinity in the water that they get naturally whenever it rains. 
So if you get a plant from the Midwest, there's a good chance that plant could die when it rains because it can't deal with the salinity. So um, let's go, should we go for full sun? We'll do that soil moisture. I'll, just keep, I'll do a little bit because I tend to not water my yard because I'm trying to choke that vine out. Soil texture. <laughs> I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with maybe sand. Salt tolerance, it appears that this thing is a very high salt tolerance. So let's see if we can find all the salt. Salt tolerance. Salt tolerance. Salt tolerance. Salt tolerance. Salt tolerance. Salt tolerance. Salt Why don't we just do, okay, we'll do any here. We'll do any there. Yeah, none of these are what's in my backyard. But, again, vines are a nice way. Maybe I'll plant one of these native vines and maybe I'll choke out the other one. Because <laughs> these at least have pretty flowers. So, so anyway, for those of you that are interested in doing more landscaping or beautifying a part of your yard, if you take a look at the lighting in terms of the, the cycle of the sun, so you can go back to this, and uh, I'll put these links online. But you can go back to this. Let's see, you want to stick with the vine. When you get to this part, if you know what, how much sun it gets, you might say, I don't know what to do with this area because things keep dying because it doesn't get enough sunlight. But well, then you can look at shade and sort of narrowly define your plants in terms of whether it, it gets a lot of moisture when you water your lawn or you have to water it constantly. If you know your soil texture, which is usually pretty easy to figure out. Um, I think a lot of it down here would probably be sandy or loam. I think you have clay more when you get uh, north of the state. What's loam? It's pretty much just like, you know, loam. <laughs> sort of like regular spongy, like topsoil, those types of things. Um, peat moss, that type of sort of, not spongy, but that sort of texture. So in other words, clay is very dense, sandy. It drains pretty well, but it doesn't really foster things like root systems. And loam is more of a dirt, sort of peat moss type mix that you would use for normal planting. So any other questions on FloridaYards.org? Do you want to see this other link or not? And this is from the Florida Native Plant Society. And these these zones that they have, these are hardiness zones. And there's a classification, and if you look here, it's based on the United States Department of Agriculture. They came up with these zones related to what crops might work better in certain areas of the United States. So the USDA has an entire map of the entire United States with each one of these zones. So if you see all the way at the tip of Florida where we are, 10A and 10B are essentially a tropical zone which you don't see for the most part elsewhere in the United States. And so based on whatever region, you can pull up the hardiness zone for that region and come up with all these plants that should work relatively well in that area. So we'll create our list of plants. This one you can do it from the county. Anybody want to give me a county? Really? Broward. No, Broward. <laughs> I'm, I'm only going to do Broward just because that's the and that's down in the, the, the tropical thing. I'm not hating on St. Lucie. But, because I was trying to get to the tropical stuff that's all throughout here. St. Lucie's in a different hardiness zone. So this will help you select the right plant for the right place. So what light range are we looking at? Full? Okay. How about the water needs? Okay. What about soil? Okay. Probably like cat. Select for special interest needs. <laughs> Hurricane resistance, sure. Let's try that one out. Yeah, what else? Butterfly nectar and host plants? Yes or no? I'm going to leave the rest of these yeah. alike because with sand. Ooh, the ones with the yellow smiling face, they denote a landscape favor. So if you look at this, this is Gumbo Limo, which is all throughout the region. It gets pretty big though, so beware. What else do we have? And again, this is an easy
easy way. So I like look at pictures and say, okay, I like that. If you have flowering plants, you can figure out whether you want more of this in your yard or not. If you have a lot of plants that have a lot of white flowers on it, you might go back and try to figure out, okay, based on some of these other things, some of these nasty looking things, you can have those to switch it up with the flowers you might have. <laughs> a slash pine, but I don't think they like having a lot of pines in Florida, especially things like the Australian pine, which they originally planted for erosion control. And then what happened? Took the water. Right. Took over, took a lot of water, but also when the pine needles fall, they kill anything underneath them because they have these huge thick mats of needles. So it'll kill the grass or anything else below it physically. On the one hand, it blocks out all the sun, so it provides great shade, but that shade is so significant, unless you water your lawn really well and you trim the tree back, it will kill all the grass, especially when the needles fall. Another thing is if you have these needles and any limb is over your house, it'll clog all your gutters. So you have to continually clean your roof as well as your gutters because they'll um, they'll build up over time. So the sable palm, by the way, it's also known as the cabbage palm. That's pretty much it. So any questions on that? No? Okay. So, in terms of what's going to be happening two weeks from tonight, I don't have to do much. I said, this is like my last lecture. You guys have to prepare for two weeks from tonight. I just have to be highly caffeinated. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> stay awake. Pay attention. Do all those things. But remember when I set up those little, set, I'll put, I'm going to put all this on Blackboard and email it to you. And I want to email it tonight before I talked about it. So I'll do it after class so you all have it. But um, remember that discussion section? Have, have any of the groups use that area where you can upload files to on Blackboard. You guys all know what I'm talking about. It's, it's similar to block, drop block, uh, Dropbox, but it's in Blackboard. And it enables you to upload files. And I think because a lot of the files are going to be large, except for maybe the Excel one, that might be the best way to do things. So to upload it by 6 p.m., so essentially by the time class starts, two weeks from tonight, the, uh, the actual PowerPoint, the report, and the spreadsheet. And then to be emailed to me is the whole peer review thing because that accounts for, I think, 40% of your grade? Or is it 30%? Somewhere in there. It's in the syllabus. So for those of you that haven't read that, check that out too. But the peer review spreadsheet, I'll make that available next week. And really, you'll be filling that out about your other group members and submitting that to me also by 6 p.m. on uh, August 9th. So for the presentations, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that they just need to be flawless. <laughs> it would be fine. I'm going to give 30 minutes for each group. You don't need to use all 30 minutes. Some groups, especially the, the one group that has three students in it, you might be able to do things a lot more quickly because you have multiple roles. So, and, and I'll probably ask a couple of questions. I won't ask a ton of questions necessarily, but that gives us a little bit of time. So at the beginning of class, and I'm going to get here, I'll try to, I mean, I, I usually get here by four. I don't plan on driving six hours to get to class next, or two weeks from tonight. But I'll get here by four, have all the Legos out, because the idea is that you'll set up your little, you'll set up your site plan, you'll put the Legos on it, and ideally, as part of the presentation, you'll incorporate what you did. So, sort of pointing out things, discuss your logic a little bit, and some of the background in terms of your specific roles. Because don't forget, there's roles involved. So, those things all have to more or less interconnect. And um, to do, so, you'll set that up, and I'll give all the groups time to do that at the beginning of class. So, once you're all set up. Then we'll figure out, we'll start doing the presentation. So, 
Do I have any volunteers in terms of who wants to go first? In terms of the group. Or if you would like to talk about it amongst your group. You know, why don't we do that? Why don't you guys break any of the urban plan groups? And if there are any volunteers, let me know at the end of the night. Let's plan to start the presentations at 6.30, just in case we run into any traffic issues. So I, mean, I don't think it'll take more than 15 minutes to set stuff up. But tonight, I mean, I'm going to be honest, tonight I was lonely. Because <laughs> I got here early, as early as possible, and I got all the Legos, and I said, all right, I'm ready to go. And I was like, who's coming with me? And it was just Matt Ross. And you know, I talked for a little bit. So, um, but anyway, but I mean, I understand Travis all the But we'll plan on starting at 6.30. So whoever that first group is, 6.30 to 7. Next year we'll go from 7 to 7.30. Third group will go from 7.30 to 8. And then I'll lecture for two hours. <laughs> we'll figure it out. So, any questions? Spreadsheet yeah, sorry, that's the only spreadsheet I want. You can do a whole bunch of other stuff. I want to see that because I got to have to check the assumptions against that spreadsheet. Any questions? No. All right. So go ahead. All the Legos are in the back. There's extra maps back there. All right.